I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. The premise of this podcast is that I wanted someone to interview me, and Amy is a perfect choice because she's super mentally strong after (laughs) writing these books, and she's been on the podcast a couple times and knows me well, and I'm excited. Thanks. I'm also a therapist, but I'll try not to. I'll try to wear my author hat rather than my therapist hat. No, wear your therapist hat. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I need it. What about your audience? I mean, you still rank, I checked before I got here on Google. You know, I want to die. I wish I could die. I mean, there's a whole bunch of I want to die kind of phrases that you still rank really high in Google. Yeah, I've dominated SEO for for any suicidal ideation. So then, what kind of email? I mean, you must get emails from people that are in really dark places, right? Yeah, I get emails from people in really dark places, um, sometimes incredibly dark, where it seems like someone's about to do something, uh, and there's nothing I can do. I can't even respond to them because, again, I'm not a professional, right? and they need the help of a professional, but I, I'm not even going to write back and say you need the help of a professional. I don't know what you're supposed to write back, and so I, so I do get a lot of those emails, uh, and really I just stick to writing stories, and you know, hopefully, and they get some insight or inspiration from my stories that eventually lead them to a better outlet for expressing their their own pain. Right. You know, sometimes I can answer basic questions like I have this situation in the business, what should I do? And I'll just say this is just what I would do. I would do this. And but most of the time I can't really answer. And you know, did you I, answer like if people I mean you must get questions from people like, "Oh, should I take this job or that job?" Like do you ever answer? Yeah, so I get a lot of questions that are just like advice, which I just explain. I'm not really like, dear Abby, I can't really tell you what to do with your life. or, But also that I don't give psychological advice online. I'm not an online therapist. There's lots of rules about offering psychological advice via the internet. And then sometimes people will say, well, can I call you on the phone? And no, I can't do that on the phone either. But uh, I just recommend people. Sometimes I just send them to like the Psychology Today website and say there's a directory of therapists. Seems kind of um, like the go-to response to say, if you want to see somebody locally, here's where you could do it. But mm. I guess so many questions from people in other countries where they don't have access to that. And I don't know what they do have access to, but they don't have mental health treatment readily available. And that's and I think one of the biggest eye-opening things for me is just how fortunate we are here in America that you can go get help 
uh, if you want to and if you uh, have health insurance and that kind of stuff. But so many people all around the world who can't even talk about it because it's so taboo over there. Yeah, and particularly like in New York City, like there's a there's a probably more therapists than people. Right, so. and uh, you know I work a lot in New York, and so people will talk to me about their shrink, kind of like it's cool to have a shrink because everybody has one, and you go talk to somebody, and that's great, and it's not a problem. But in rural places where I've worked, it was embarrassing, or there's still a stigma attached to it where it's much more difficult, and partly because you're probably related to the therapist in town because there's only one or it's, you know, somebody that you know and uh, there's a lot of different issues around that. But, hmm. Well, and what about when it comes to comedy? So we know that there's been comedians in the past who say, I do comedy to keep me from being depressed. And then there's been a whole list of comedians who uh, have talked about their depression, but unfortunately there's been comedians when it comes to suicide and substance abuse too. Do people ever worry about you? Like, oh gosh, now James is into comedy because he's, no, because I think, out? I think, and I don't know um, if this almost started with me or or if I'm just a part of it, but it seems like I see a lot of, just in the past few months, I've seen a lot of, like, let's call them life coaches, recommend to their clients, oh, try an open mic at comedy. And I wonder if it's because a lot of people see that I've been all out trying it, and or at least some of them maybe, but... Uh, I think I think for me, I just see it as this. I love comedy, and I see it this. I see comedians as kind of like today's modern philosophers, and it's also this incredibly difficult and complex skill. Like no, most people don't realize how complex a skill it is. Like it goes so far beyond just being funny and being able to tell a funny joke. That it was just a challenge to to learn, and uh, and still learning. Like I don't think you ever. It's one of those things you never stop learning. Right. And yeah, I think for most of us, even who do public speaking, I would be terrified at the thought of doing comedy because we don't have that expectation of making people laugh and how scary it must be to to try to do that and what yeah, a challenge. Like in public speaking, if you make someone laugh, the audience is grateful because nobody else made them laugh. So, right. so that's great. Like the laugh is just a, a huge wave of relief for them and it gives you energy and you only have to do it once every few minutes, make them laugh to get that kind of response. If you did, if that, if you did the same thing in on a comedy stage, you'd be the worst. It would be the worst comedy set in the world, right? And when you're doing a, a speech, if somebody if they laugh, great. But if they don't, if you have kind of an off the cuff joke and it doesn't really take off, it's not a big deal. You just move no. on to the next thing yeah. and it doesn't matter. And, and it doesn't stress you out. Like, oh, right. I didn't laugh at that. All right, I'm going on. You could even address it. Oh, you didn't laugh at that. I'm clearly not going to tell those jokes anymore. Like you could you could meta address it. And I think you know, you've opened it up to making it clear that it's a skill. I think from a lot of us who don't know a lot about comedy, it comes across that people are either funny or they're not. And the one thing that you've done is just made it clear there's all of these skills that you learn and you practice and you get better and uh, and that you can learn it. And I think it's given us hope for the rest of us. That well, well, think about any hard skill. So think about like for instance, writing. Writing is a hard. To write well is a hard skill. We see all these people now writing books uh, that. The books aren't that well written, but now it's you know you can self publish, and I'm 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 a big proponent of self publishing, so whatever. But but writing well is really difficult, and you think of all the you could divide it into all these micro skills. There's uh you know did you do the research? Are you uh did you are you writing without ego? Are you writing where each word is important? You know, kind of like kind of the the very te- in the weeds skills of writing, which is where every line's important. You you give cliffhangers even in a nonfiction book. Uh, you tell stories. Uh, this there's maybe twenty different micro skills to becoming a good writer, and, and each one is a separate micro skill that you have to fully develop. Uh, and it's the same thing with comedy, where humor is just one of the micro skills, and then there might be skills like, uh, are you good with? Um, riffing with the crowd are you are you likable are you which is a skill are you uh is your timing good which is a skill like i've seen comedians in the beginning of their career and and now and you could see the the jokes are the same the only thing that's different is their timing and they're a thousand times better so and timing is different when you're on stage as opposed to when you're with a group of your friends so uh this you know i was talking to someone yesterday who's a great comedy writer and he knows how to construct a joke, 
but he's not a good performer. So he could never be mm. a stand-up comedian, even though he's like super funny. One of the famously one of the funniest people on the planet. And uh, uh, but will never be a stand-up comic because that's a performance also. And in stand-up comedy, you have to be good at improvising. You have to be good at making voices. You have to be good at like acting out some of your joke. Uh, so it's a, it's all these micro skills that are independent of each other. Chess, you have to be good at the opening, the end game, the middle game, tactics, positional play, all separate skills completely. Right. And do you feel like then in your case in particular, I mean, you, that you could learn just about any skill that you could, if you wanted to go down that certain path. I mean, you did chess, you did poker for a while, you and stand up. Yeah, anything that has kind of like that game-like structure, you figure out what the micro skills are, which you could do by reading a lot, trying a lot, and watching a lot. You can figure out what the micro skills are, uh, and then you fit you 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 focus on you you kind of compartmentalize those micro skills and try to get better at each at each one. So, um, uh, and it's funny because then when you get better at certain micro skills, you see how it translates to other areas of life. So, for instance, with comedy, very important to not only do crowd work, which means talking to the, making jokes back and forth with the crowd, but to also control the crowd. Like they can't be on their own doing their own thing. They have to be paying attention to you and you have to dump, you have to be the most alpha person in the crowd for those few minutes. So that one micro skill helps when I go on television, because mm -hmm. if I'm on a panel, so there's the one or two anchors and there might be other guests on the show, if I want to be noticed in the three minutes I'm on television with five other people, I have to make sure I'm quote unquote controlling the crowd, which is basically those anchors and those other guests. And so you have to know how to do that in a way that's not rude and that they're not even aware that that's what you're doing. And that's a micro skill in comedy that's unrelated to humor. And it applies to so many other areas of life, like sales, negotiating, um, dealing with employees, dealing with customers, uh, TV, you know, other things. I think that's important because I think a lot of people go into something, it doesn't work out the first time they do it. They think I'm bad at, I'm a bad salesperson or I'm just, that wasn't meant to be rather than thinking I can learn it and that there are skills I can get to, to gain along the way. Right. So, I mean, this is relates to 13 things mentally strong people don't do. Like if you give up the first time you try something, you, you can't get good at it. Even if you're super talented at it. Like I've seen, I, I, I was roommates once with this guy, his kid brother was probably the most talented chess player in history. He was 11 or 12 years old and he was an unbelievable chess player. I have never seen talent like that. And he just rode off his talent. And by the time he was 17 or 18, he was an, a complete unknown. Like he hmm. just never developed that talent into the, I mean, he was already at the level, just on talent alone, he was already at the level where he was in the, top of world's chess players, but he needed to develop the skill to be the best in the world. And he just never worked at it. I couldn't raise me to my next question about success. Do you ever, you know, so you, you've learned certain skills, you do things, and then you have this other area of your life where you're James Altucher. So you can call anybody you want on the phone to come on your podcast and get a yes, pretty much, right? Not always. Like Steve Cohen, who's in the audience here. <laughs> How many people do you write a day to get on this podcast? I try and do about 50 or so. You know, I try and like set that as a number. I don't always do that many, you know, and some, they all, most of them don't say, oh no, screw you. They say, right. oh, we're not free now. Follow up in a couple of months. Pound sand. No, you know, but they're, they're, and so you have to just keep up with them. Yeah. People usually have to have like, uh, like for instance, it's funny. We were just coming in yeah. yesterday. It's, it's easier to get a billionaire on the podcast than let's say a famous actor. Interesting. Because they just don't need any more exposure for anything. If they write a book, everyone's either going to buy it or not. Like they don't need any exposure right. for anything. Whereas a billionaire wants to get, kind of give back to society and spread the, his or her message. And, you know, it sort of depends on what their particular agendas are. So when we write to people, it's not only that we have a good show with a great demographic for their message, we kind of have to understand what their agendas are and and write towards those agendas to convince them to come on. Not with everybody, but with like the type of person who doesn't usually go on a podcast, 
uh, it's very. It could be very difficult. Do you? Does if somebody won't? Does that ever get you down or rejection in general? Do you? No, because we get rejected. You know, let's say up to forty-five times a day. Exposure <laughs> therapy. Once you do it enough, you realize it's not that bad, right? I mean, if there's somebody I really, really am dying to get on, we will pursue for years. And uh, like Richard Branson, we eventually got on. Uh, I really Parker wanted to get Judy Bloom on. She came Parker on. Parker Posey. Yeah, Parker Posey. We haven't had on yet. But we're we're working on that one. And Judd Apatow. Yeah. Hopefully he will come on. And then what about the other end of the spectrum? Like because of your success, do you ever struggle with imposter syndrome? Do you ever feel like, gosh, I don't deserve all of this, or I'm just this guy going through life and I don't deserve to be here? Yeah, all the time. And I think, and I was gonna ask you about this, like I think self-sabotage is 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 one of the biggest pro like it, the first time I ever heard the word self-sabotage, I thought that is such bullshit like do people really s intentionally sabotage themselves but i think what happens is is that it's it's like a blind spot it's like right. unintentional so at some point in their lives they lost self esteem over something and so whatever that something is if they're going to get it as an adult the clo let's let's say it's money let's mm -hmm. say they, they, for some reason they don't believe they deserve money or they were raised in a family where they were taught money's evil or they were raised to think you're not good enough to make money, just get a regular job and whatever. So let's say they're getting closer and closer to a big payday, like they're selling a company or they're selling, uh, doing a, a big real estate sale or whatever it is. The self-sabotage comes in is the closer they get to the date where the payoff is supposed to happen, the more and more anxious right. they get. And then at some point, um, let's say the, the anxiety starts three months before the big payday. Um, at some point in those three months, they'll sabotage themselves. They'll call up the person who's supposed to pay them and they'll say, listen, just give me half right now and we're good. Right. And so they just sabotage themselves out of half of what they were going to make. And then the person might think, oh, well, he was willing to take half. I'm going to only offer 10%. And then suddenly it's a whole different ball game and they ruin their chances and it becomes a legal fight and you know, boom. Or in a relationship, somebody might think, oh, I'm not worthy of somebody who is a, a good, nice, intelligent um, partner. Um, so, so at first that helps them because, oh, I don't care because I'm not worthy of it anyway. And then they have confidence, but then they realize, oh, somebody does like me and I'm getting closer and closer to uh, whether it's getting married or having a solid relationship, whatever, they'll do something to self-sabotage. Like right. they'll get overly jealous or insecure or, you know, irrationally try to control things they can't control or competitive. And I, I think self-sabotage is a, is a common thing. So that, and that happens to me all the, all the time. It happens to me in like almost every area of life. So in terms of imposter syndrome, I think that happens to me with with everything I do. So you have to just be aware of it. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then what do you do when you sabotage yourself? Like what are some of the things that you so, do? So so I notice, okay, this is anxiety that's occurring because I'm self-sabotaging right now and I just have to sit on my hands. And how do you sabotage yourself? Well, I might do that thing where I'll call somebody and uh, like two months in advance of a payday yeah. and say, listen, don't worry about it. Just give me half right now and we're all good. So I just sabotage myself and they might even say, why would you do that? Just wait two more months and you'll get the payday. And I'm like, no, 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 just okay. Like that's all sabotage. And or, or th being, let's say, you know, irrationally jealous or whatever, uh, or, or thinking that um, oh, my podcast is no good or my writing is no good. Those are harder to self-sabotage, but... Uh, uh, I think relationships and money are, are are big things or friendships. And I think then you just have to be like, let's take the, the money thing. I have to be aware, okay, this is the sort of thing I self-sabotage myself on. So I should just do nothing. Since I don't know where my blind spot might be, I don't know which of my actions are going to be self-sabotage. I should just do nothing mm -hmm. and sit on my hands as much as possible or deliver value like above and beyond what yep. they thought I was going to do. So uh, I have a technique I call um, over-promise and over-deliver. So I'm always trying in those situations to over-promise and over-deliver and, and ignore the things that I know are re somehow related to self-sabotage, even if I can't 
even if I'm not mentally capable of connecting all the dots, I know I'm self-sabotaging in all of these areas. So it's going to happen somewhere. So the more successful you get, do you get more anxiety about, you know, am I worthy of this? Am I, is something bad going to happen? Yeah, because each new level of success is something unique. Like, let's say you made X dollars one year and you were anxious about that. You're like, okay, then you got it and then it's no problem. Now suddenly you're going to make 10 times X dollars. Oh, I was worthy of, I realize I'm worthy of X, but I'm not, I'm certainly not worthy of 10 times X. That seems ridiculous. And that's now you're now you're in the game for self sabotage. Self sabotage is ready to attack you, and you have to really work, you have to acknowledge in your head, okay, I'm 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 going to self sabotage myself, and then you have to sit on your hands as much as possible. And then what about the fact that you can call Richard Branson and he shows up? Do you ever just think like, how did this get to be my life that I have these people that that come in here and they want to talk to me, and somehow I'm making this podcast and people are listening and. Yeah, like I'll tell you a story, um, and this is more related to business, but I always had a saying for like a decade. So I invest in a lot of private companies, like angel investments. And I always would tell my, uh, so I have one partner for my angel, these these private investments. And I'd always tell my partner, um, if the CEO of the company is calling me, I'm specifically never going to call him back and I'm gonna write that company off to a zero. Because if they're asking for, if they got to the point where they went down the chain of their advisors and now they're calling me, then they probably are going out of business. Like, and I'm not going to waste my time even responding. And, but then recently my partner started responding. And he's like, no, you're wrong. You should call them back because you're actually the person they really need to talk to. Because oh. now I've been through 30 years of building businesses and I have a lot of experience and I've been a CEO, an investor, a board member, an entrepreneur. Like I've I've been involved in big companies, small companies, built companies from scratch, made big companies bigger. So actually now I do have the experience. They should be calling me, but it was hard for me to realize that uh, I was delivering any value at all other than a last recourse before they went out of business. So now, so I had to be told specifically that I'm not as as stupid as I normally think. Now I'm still largely stupid, but not as much as I thought. Wait, in your writing, you'll call yourself stupid a lot. Do you think that in your head? Like, will you think, oh, I'm so stupid? Yeah, because being smart in most areas, you can't be smart in every area. So I think a big, I think my first big problem was after the, the first time I sold a business, I thought to myself, oh, I made a lot of money. That must mean I'm a genius because that's how society conflates money. I'm smart in everything now. And so I would just spread it all around. Like I'm, I'm great at this. I'm great at that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to invest in this. Everything I touch is going to turn to gold. And then I lost all of my money doing that. And so I had to really teach myself not to be kind of arrogant in that way. And just remind myself all the time that maybe I'm smart in like one or two areas, but stupid in almost every other area. Mm -hmm and be willing to learn all the time in every other area of, of life. And look, that's how, as just a, a typical example, that's how I invest. I only invest in a company if the CEO is smarter than me at, at, at that business. And if, the, if my co-investors, I have to have co-investors, if my co-investors are smarter and have more resources than me, because it tells me they've done more work than me and the CEO is better than me at figuring out his business. So I don't need to think after that. Like, if it's the reverse, if I think, oh, I'm smart, so I'm gonna, this is gonna be the biggest trend of the 21st century. Uh, I'm gonna put all my money into it. Then that's probably gonna be a failure. Hmm. And then, what about people? Because you'll say sometimes that you don't like people, and then I like you. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, and then you have a interesting, and from what I've read and from what I know of you, you have an interesting relationship when it comes to humans. That you, I mean, there's been times in your life where you talk about being lonely, and you have times when you reach out to people, and then other times where, like, you'll say you're shy if you go to a party. Tell me about that. How does all of that work? <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you as a as a therapist, because this is the same question I've asked my therapist. <laughs> How many close friends do you think a person should or could have? Five. I think about five is right. Uh, uh, so sometimes I have less than that. Sometimes I have a little more than that, but like around five for close friends. And uh, uh, I think in general, I'm a real poor, I, I, it's hard to say I'm a poor judge of 
character. I think at times I've been, I've, I've either hated people too much right away or liked people too much right away. So I realized, uh, you know, I wasn't as good a judge of character as I thought uh, one way or the other. And so I try really hard not to judge too fast but like sometimes I'm just in a situation where like, oh, I hate everybody here, even though I don't know anybody there. And maybe that's just a way to keep myself safe. I don't know. And then other times I'm also really introverted in the sense that like I could be social with my friends or in a group where I know a lot of people. But if I have to, if I'm in a, if I'm in a party where, or a situation where I have to get to know a lot of people, I can't do it for more than like a half hour to an hour and then I have to recharge. So introversion in the sense that I don't mind being around people, but I have to recharge very quickly and, and often. And then in terms of shyness, uh, I, I act. So mm. I'll just say to myself, I can go, I'm going to play somebody who can just talk to anybody and then I'll just go off to any, anybody and talk to them. And that's how I get it. But I'm just naturally shy though outside of that. Right, okay. Huh. And I, w- I think people are, would be surprised by that, right? Because you're James Elcher on the you do your podcast and you put your story out there for millions of people. How can you not want to talk to people? <laughs> well, and, but uh, uh, this is where stand-up comedy or public speaking helps is that you get used to right. talking to strangers uh, in a very public setting where all eyes are on you. So that that I, so. So that doesn't necessarily help with shyness, except what I'll do is, again, it's using a micro skill in one area and it, to, to apply it to another area. I'll take that same performance-like skill, like being able to perform and having, and having a commanding presence, and then I'll be able to go up, up playing that role, I'll be able to go up to people and, and talk to people. How much do you care what people think of you? Uh, usually zero. Really? Yeah. I mean, I want people to... Uh, like I really hate it when I get too much hate, and I for some reason I get a, a lot of hate, but I also get a lot of not hate. It's just that the haters tend to be more vocal. Uh, do you read articles about you? Do you read Amazon reviews? Do you read stuff that people say? Uh, I'll read articles that are about me, and some of them are, are like unbelievably hateful. Like right. I don't even know why they would make up these lies. Like like people, uh, it's even people I know will write will just make up lies just to get I don't know I get I get a little upset at that like why I would call them why did you just say that as a lie and nobody would ever have an answer for me and uh, anyway um but uh in general I don't really care what people think do you you read reviews like if people review your book do you read it do not read, really no do you still read comments on your blog no nah, I mean unless unless you know it's like one of those things um, and this is how I treat comments on the blog because that's something I can control. I don't invite someone into my living room if I think they're going to shit on the floor. Mm-hmm. So if co- someone comes into my living room and shits on the floor, I kick them out. So if someone is just insulting in my blog without, they're allowed to disagree, of course, and then it's a discussion. But if they just say, this guy, he should be dead or whatever, then I'll just delete it. And then how do you decide to let into your inner circle if you're somebody that says I'm not always a good judge of character? How do you decide who to to put your energy into? You've said you're notoriously not good at uh, keeping in touch with people. I think I think You know what I love about fantasy sports? is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays 
under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like The key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, 
Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance. Yeah, so I'm really bad at keeping in touch with people. Uh, like, again, Steve Cohen's here. He writes 70,000 emails a day keeping in touch with people. I don't know how he has the time to do it. I'm really bad at keeping in touch. I'm really bad at following up on important introductions that I might have even asked for. Uh, uh, so, But I think over time, because people know that about me, usually people forgive me for it and they know I didn't have bad intentions. Like... I mean, I've had situations where I've blown off people for years and then I'll just write and say, look, I'm sorry. I was going through something. Would love to have coffee. And then they're, if they're a friend, they're, they're fine. Um, but uh, in general, people show you who they are pretty quickly. And I always listen to who they are. And, uh, you know, a, a classic thing is, I was telling a, a guest this, a few weeks ago before this podcast started, I said that if I think, um, I was telling him, if I think someone cheated on their wife, if I even suspect it, I probably won't ask them to come on the podcast. And and he made the point that, yeah, if they're willing to cheat on their wife, they're probably going to, they have no problem cheating you in business. He said he, that's how he's run his businesses. And he was a very successful guy. Um and so I think people pretty quickly show you the kind of person that they are. And so my thing is I'm trying not to do the Malcolm Gladwell blink where I can figure someone out in five seconds and just wait till someone shows me who they are. Because they will show you. Do you ever worry that people like you for your money or that they like you for your fame? Um, since, since, you know... Since I'm since I so regularly like go broke, <laughs> I hope they don't <laughs> like me for my money because that's like a crapshoot. <laughs> but uh, I but I, I say that I don't think I'm gonna have the same types of problems again. But because uh, hopefully I've learned over over time how not to go broke. But um, no, I think you know every relationship has its dynamic. Like, do you think people like you because they like the books you wrote? maybe a little bit. That's how they reach out and get to know you. Um, but then ultimately, uh, I don't think, I think like 20 years ago when I used to like people for their money, uh -huh. those relationships never really worked out well for me. Like I would get too tense or I would want something from them and it, the relationship wouldn't develop organically and then nothing would happen and the relationship would go away. Or if I liked someone for their looks, then those relationships wouldn't work out well either. Those were usually pretty bad relationships. And how do you, when you decide, okay, this isn't a good uh, friendship, a good relationship, do you, because I know you talk about cutting out people who are dragging you down. Do you just, do you ghost them? Do you say something? Do you, yeah, how do you usually, cut people out? Usually I ghost, I, I ghost in the sense that uh, I, I, I just stop returning all messages. And I don't really mean to. It's just that I don't return the first one and then they get upset and then I get guilt, feel guilty and then time goes on and I just never respond to them. Um, but that's usually happens after like a two or three strikes and you're out kind of thing where I realize, oh, that was a really bad thing that person did either to me or to someone else. And if I see that a couple of times, then, oh, this is not, this is not good for me. Okay. And then- How do you, how do you eliminate people? Yeah, sometimes, or when do you decide? sometimes I can be upfront with somebody and say, gosh, I don't think this is good for either of us. Like I had a friend that would call and, and complain about all the bad things going on in their life and repeatedly, and I could offer suggestions like, oh, why don't you try this? And it was one of those, well, you know, the world is terrible, horrible and awful. And those things will never work for me. But, and I just felt after a while, like I was being more of a captive audience of saying, okay, I'm going to allow you to to complain every day and I'm attending your pity party essentially so to have to say I don't think I'm I don't think this is helpful for either of us for me to do this and let's try something else if you want to call and talk about happy things great or if you want to Do you say that to them? I have before and it sort of depends on the relationship. Do they change? Uh, some people so I have one friend and we have conversations now and it's not that like I won't be there for you when you're down or when you're in trouble in life, but I, you know, I actively want to say I'll walk beside you while you try to fix it. I don't want to just stay stuck in your misery and sort of become codependent in keeping you stuck in your misery. Or um, and so I have one friend, and that's worked that we've been able to sort of work through that and to say, you know, gosh, I 
I want to still be friends with you, but not in a way that isn't healthy for either of us. See, I think people have to be kind of at the same level in the sense that let's say you thought the world was miserable and everything was miserable. Then you could join in the pity party. You could attend that right. pity party together. And that might be a fine friendship, or at least it might have an opportunity to last longer. Right. Um, but I, th- I think just like in any romantic relationship or friendship or anything, if you, you know, in a, in a romantic relationship, you're in romance with the other person. In a friendship, you're friends with the other person. You're not the therapist or the parent. And so if, if the roles somehow change where in a friendship, you go from being the, the mother and they're the child, that won't work out. Or if you become the therapist and they become the patient for your entire lifetime of your friendship, that's not going to work out. You kind of have to be friends for right. it to work out. Like they, you do friendly things and they do friendly things. Right. Um, and uh, I think people have to be kind of at the same level for those things to work out. I think so too. And it doesn't mean you're at the same place in life. You just have to be kind of like, to use a new age term, kind of at the same vibration. Right. And I think some people don't realize uh, you know, how much other people can drain your mental strength. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I've appreciated about the things that you talk about is how you set your life up to make sure that you don't have certain things around you that just drain your mental strength. And because I think I talk to so many people who will say, well, if you're mentally strong, you should, you know, just be able to keep putting up with negativity or that you, if you worked in a toxic work environment, you'd be okay. If you quit your job, it means you're too weak. And, but then I've heard you say stuff like you used to, I don't know if you don't anymore, that you didn't used to buy Doritos and stuff like that because it took too much willpower to not eat them. So you set yourself up to say, I'm not going to put myself in that situation or with toxic people. I'm just not going to put myself in that. Right. The the Doritos thing is a great example. Like one of the things that I like about New York City is I can always order out. And so I call this the Airbnb diet because I mostly did this in Airbnbs because you know I didn't have, there was no reason for me to shop for long-term food in a kitchen because I was just moving all the time. So I always eat out or order delivery. You can't order a bag of Doritos as a dessert from a restaurant. Like they just don't have that on the dessert menu. A bag of Doritos is not is not on the dessert menu of any restaurant in the world. But if a bag of Doritos is in my apartment or house, I'm going to eat it. Like the entire bag is going to be in my stomach at some point. And so uh, just because I know me. And uh, uh, so it's the same thing with with friends and and your and what you and the uh, environment you have around you. Like it, it, that toxicity is gonna, go into you, you're going to consume it if you, if you're around it. And so it's really important to, you know, no person can succeed on their own. It's impossible. And you, and that there's that saying, you're the average of the five people uh, you're around the most. That's really true. Like you have to be around good people all the time. Like if you can make it 50% of the time, that's better than 20%. If you can make it 80% of the time, that's better than 50 I mean, sometimes you have to deal with people, you know, you can't help dealing with, but it should, you should try at least 80, 20, where 80% is people who are just really good for you. Yeah, I agree completely. And then how well, I mean, where do you put your mental energy? You only have so much time, you only have so much money, so much resources, so much mental energy. How do you decide where to put it? So you set yourself up for success in lots of ways. So you say, okay, I'm not going to waste my time worrying about junk food in the house and I'm not going to worry about uh, toxic people being a drain on me. Is there other stuff that you do that sort of set you up for success? Because I think that's really important. Yeah, I try to. Um, I try to be. I mean, in addition to just basic health, because I think that's you can't be health. You can't be successful unless you're just in general healthy. Right. Um, and and but that also includes emotional health. So you can't be having, you know, fights all night with a romantic partner. Uh, you 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 can't be trying to. Uh, you know, control it. Like if you get overly upset about the weather, you're not going to be a success because you can't think that you can control things that you, you that's impo- that no one's ever been able to control. Um, so I think those are kind of key basic things. But other than that, I try to, I used to say to myself, okay, I'm going to write every day. I'm going to, and like I would tell people, write 10 ideas a day, which I still try to do. But most important is to be creative every day. And, and, and I, even though you can't quantify this, I try to be 1% better at that every day than the day before. So even though that's something that's hard to quantify, I try to think that way. And then that compounds. 
So that's, you're going to, if someone, if you're going up against somebody who doesn't do that, you're always going to do better. If you're the type of person who's always trying to be creative every day and try to improve on that every day, where are you going to be five years from now? You're going to be 15,000 times more creative than you were when you started doing that, just from the power of compounding 1% a day. What about burnout though? So many people are worried if you if you just go, go, go and you're always trying to get better, that someday you're going to burn out. Do you ever worry about that? Yeah. So I was doing this podcast three times a week uh, and now we've moved down to two. I, I felt like I was getting a little burned out at three. It was really hard because to do three podcasts a week, we had to tape four or five so we would have a good backlog. And each podcast I would prepare and do and then come down from maybe 10 to 15 hours. So just doing four pocket, three, three podcasts a week was a full work week. And then on top of that, I was doing comedy and I was invo- running a business and involved in my investments and involved in my relationships. And so I was getting burnt out. Um, but then I just, this now I do two Comedy, I do a little less of writing posts. I don't write a post every single day anymore. I just do a little, I did a little bit less of, of everything. But then what I do... Do now I'm able to focus again and be one percent better. I felt like I wasn't able to be one percent better every day when I was doing too many things. So that was for me the sign of burnout is that I I'm not able to do one percent better every day. And so then was it hard to let go of that? Like, did you have any? Oh, I should be able to do that. I should be able. To- yeah, I'm still going through that because I feel like I should be able to do everything I want to do, but you you just can't. It's so like it- I'm sure you have like a million ideas for books, and then you have to decide. You know, where, where are you going to prioritize? Where are you going to put your time? Right, right. And it's all about, again, going back to that. How do you say no to certain things? How do you figure that out? How, how do you, you prioritize? So you have the you have the you have the franchise. You know, thirteen things mentally strong. X don't do. And as opposed to writing um, a thriller mystery, right? <laughs> you, it's better for you to get the next advance on the thirteen things, and then maybe later you could write a, a mystery novel if that's been your your desire all your life. Right, which fortunately it hasn't. But there's so many things that come. You know, people are like, oh, you should do a course. You should make an app. You should do this. Do more speaking engagements. And you really just have to figure out, you know, what do you want to do? It's wonderful to have so many opportunities, as you know, but to then figure out how do you just pick which ones you want to do? Where is your values and your priorities? And how important is the money versus what you do with your time? You should start a Facebook group. The 13 Things Mentally Strong People Do Facebook group. And then everyone could uh, share, like, their experiences, like, you know, and then you, a community develops. Like, is this, uh, you know, I'm in this situation at work. What would a mentally strong person do here? And then everybody comments and weighs in off of the principles in your book. And See, then, then there's no work for you. Uh, you just set up this group, and you could participate in it like anyone else. You just can't stop sharing ideas, right? When you're <laughs> the second I've walked in the going. door, you always give me great ideas, and it's one of those things where you think, well, why didn't I think of that? But speaking of ideas, don't you think, and thank you for that one, because I do think that's a, an interesting one. Don't you think a lot of people struggle to actually implement ideas? So, for example, when I was on your podcast the second time, we talked about a business idea and uh, e-commerce and how to do it. I got so many emails from people that are like, I'm so going to do this. Thank you so much. This was great. Some of them had questions. And we gave them pretty much everything they needed. And I told every single one of those people, when you set up your website, when you have questions, come back and let me know what you have for questions uh, or if there's problems or share your success stories. I never had a single person come back and say anything. Do you think for most people that that is a stumbling block though? They come up with an idea or they borrow somebody else's idea, but then they don't do it. How do you go from thinking about it to actually doing it? Yeah, I think if some, well, first off, something has to excite you. Mm -hmm. So like- it wouldn't excite me if um, someone said, "Hey, uh, LeBron James wants to give you basketball lessons." <laughs> uh, like I wouldn't really care, so I wouldn't do it. Or, or even having the idea, I should approach LeBron James about giving me basketball lessons. Like I wouldn't be excited about that. I wouldn't do it. Um, so you have to be excited about something. But I think also you have to figure out two things. So sometimes I come up with a list of ideas of things to do like books to write or posts to write or businesses to start or um, ideas for other businesses or let's say 10 ideas for Amy to to do. Um, and, and then let's say it's business ideas and let's say one of the businesses I really like. Then I'll think to myself, okay, the next list of 10 ideas are 10 really easy execution steps, next execution steps that I could do to 
see if this idea uh, is going to fail or not. And and that's only if some idea really excites me. Most of the ideas I come up with don't excite me. I'm just exercising the idea muscle. But like, for instance, one time a friend of mine and I came up with an idea over a brunch. He he was introducing me to his new girlfriend and he was saying, and, and I asked him, well, what? And he said, like, we're going, he made, he, he, it was sort of funny. He's in his forties. He said, we're going steady now. You know, it's like a high school phrase. And I'm like, well, what does that mean in today's world going steady? And he said, well, we each deleted all of our dating apps off of our phone. So we kind of thought of this idea over brunch. Um, what about an app, a going steady app, where if both sides click on it and link to each other, it deletes all the dating apps off of both phones and that it informs the other person if anything new happens that is dating related. Oh, yeah. And so my friend was like, that's a great idea. We should do it. And so that was on a Saturday. And then on Sunday, I went on Freelancer. Doc. I spec'd out what that Going Steady app would look like. Uh, so I wrote like 10 things that this app would have to have. So that was the spec. I put it on freelancer.com. I said, I, can, is there anybody out there who can program this for me? Uh, I got back about 30 responses from India and Malaysia software companies there. And I had one basic question, which is, can you can an app see the other apps on your phone? Because you have to be able to delete the dating apps. Oh, right. So you have to say, oh, Tinder's on the phone. I'm going to delete Tinder. Um, and... So that was just the one question I had for everybody who responded. And the response I got was, you can do it on Android, you can't do it on Apple. Uh, so I, so the idea was a bad idea, and I stopped it. So so we came up with the idea Saturday. I spec'd it out Sunday morning. It was very easy for me to post it on freelancer.com. I had one basic question to see if people could implement it or not. And then they couldn't, so it's a bad idea. Um, as opposed to my friend, called him Monday, told him what I had done, and he's like, well, I did nothing. <laughs> so, but I was able to to see and learn something. Now this is useful useful information for any apps I might want to do in the future or or due diligence I have on other apps. And uh, I I was able to to fail fast and I learned something from it. And why do you think? Because you know, I think so many people say, oh, I, I I don't know. They come up with excuses to not implement ideas because because they come up with because they're looking at the goal rather than the process. Mm. They're looking. If you were to say, I want to write. Um, a line by line analysis of the Bible, and uh, you start thinking of all the research you would have to do, and you know all the different things to get you to finish it by the end of the year or whatever. It'd be too big. You would never start if you just think, okay, well, I'm going to start with the first four lines of Genesis and see how that goes. You would be able to start, and if it's like not interesting, you'd you'd say, okay, that's a bad idea, and you'd you'd stop. Uh, but like, for instance, when when we had you on the podcast talking about your your business, th those that's an an easy to implement type of business, not trivial. But there are next execution steps that aren't so hard. Right. Okay, register a domain name, pick a category to sell in where you know you can buy cheap from here and sell expensive there. Like, and and you know, and you and you don't have to know the category that works. Pick ten potential categories: uh, pets, jewelry, handbags, makeup, books, whatever, and then you can start the research. Uh, and so you can come up with ten e to easy to execute steps, no problem. But people don't do that; they focus too much on, "Oh, this is too much work for me," and I first I have to make the mortgage every month and take my kids to school, and they don't think of these easy to do. Like the entire time I spent on that Going Steady app was probably 15 minutes altogether, 20 minutes. Five minutes to outline it, five minutes to post it on Freelancer, and five to 10 minutes to ask a bunch of questions to people who emailed me back. Yeah, I run into a lot of people who will have a to-do list, and if they checked off the things on their to-do list, it would be like 12 minutes. And you know, make a phone call, do this really quick, do that. But sometimes I think we talk ourselves into thinking it's bigger, harder, or something that we can't do. And that, for instance, these people that had emailed me, they all sounded so excited and this is going to be great and wonderful and I can't wait to do it and it's extra income and and then they don't. And that had happened in my real life too, that people would ask me about it. I'd tell them everything they needed to know. I was excited about it. They would 
sound like they were excited about it, but then people don't do it. And so I think you're a wonderful example of somebody who says, okay, not only am I an actual idea machine, but then you pick and choose which ones to do and then you actually go do it. Yeah, and like a lot of things, like for instance, it's really hard to write a novel. Novel seems like a big, hard thing to do. But if you write 300 words a day, which is about two or three paragraphs, um, and you could write 300 words a day uh, on like, if you're on a subway commute or a bus commute, it's just four or five stops. You could write three or four paragraphs and you can do that every day instead of just reading the New York Post or some gossip column or playing some game on your phone. You can write 300 words a day, no problem. Everybody in the world can do it. Nobody doesn't have enough time to write 300 words a day. You would have, uh, uh, you know, 100,000 words in a year, which is bigger than the average novel. So you would be able to write and rewrite a novel in a year and you could do that every year. You have, let's say you have another 40 years to live. You could write 40 novels if you only wrote 300 words a day. Right. Uh, and so there, there's, there's nothing out there that you can't do the easy steps. So even take like stand-up comedy. In any town, some bar has an open mic night that nobody goes to, so there's no real reputation risk. And you could just go at six o'clock at night to some bar where there's four other people listening and you could try some stupid jokes that won't work and you just did it. You just did stand-up comedy for the first time. And so there's nothing no, that, everything has easy first steps that you could do. And you know all the things that you talk about are you know as a therapist these are all in line with things that we try to get people to do but so to recap you when it comes to rejection you just do it exposure exposure therapy for rejection you know it's not that bad when it comes to doing something that's anxiety provoking you figure out what state to get your body in a little bit anxious is best for you when it comes to stand up so that works for you so for somebody else to know when they're doing something anxiety provoking are they better off to be excited or should they meditate to calm down so that's a good one and then oh we talk about accepting just accepting i'm sort of an anxious guy and that's okay i can do these things anyway. yeah and, and knowing where you're going to be anxious so that like for instance i might not know how i'm going to self-sabotage myself in a situation but i know i will try to like my brain will try to so making sure that I sit on my hands rather than take some impulsive action, that for me is key in, in recognizing. Some people won't, you have to kind of prepare for, in advance for self-sabotage. Right. Otherwise, I'll just do the self-sabotage. So yeah, so admitting that you are likely to self-sabotage and then to say, how do I prevent it from happening? And then you set yourself up for success. So you say, I don't buy the Doritos. I separate myself from unhealthy people so that I can have a successful life. And then you focus on the process rather than having these clear-cut goals so that you're not either a complete failure or a complete uh, success. You just say, what's the process? What else? There's lots of things that you, <laughs> all of these little skills that you probably, um, maybe you know, but that we often teach in therapy, but boom, 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 boom. And you've described them and how they implement in your life. So even though you say, I'm not a self-help guru, but this is what works for me, I'm not surprised that it works for other people too, because uh, those are all strategies that work for lots of different things in life. Yeah. And the only reason I don't ever portray it as advice is because I just think it's for me, I like to write. So it's much more interesting for me to tell it as my own story, like my own horribly shameful and embarrassing story. Um, and then how I learned from it. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's why I enjoy writing. My my only problem now is my, my anxiety now is I've kind of written about going broke uh, in 5,000 different ways. Like I used to, for seven years, maybe I wrote an article every single day. So that's, you know, over 2,500 articles. And a lot of them had to do with failure and bouncing back. And I would legitimately try to slice it in different ways. Like there's different things to look at. Like if I failed at money, how did it affect my relationships? How did it affect, you know, my drugs I was taking? How did it affect jobs I had or homes I owned? Like I, 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 I sliced and diced my experiences in so many different ways. My anxiety now is what do I write about? So then I would write about pop culture things that excite me and why and how it fits into my ideas. But I think a challenge for me is to find new outlets for creativity. Even though I enjoy writing so much, I have to sort of dip into new resources somehow. And that's that's been kind of a stumbling block for me. Do you ever worry if you're successful and you stay successful, like people will, won't be as interested in watching what happens to, to James next or if you can't always talk about 
failure that people won't be able to relate to as much? Yeah, completely. And I study other people who get through that hurdle successfully. You see some comedians who are obviously super successful, but they're able to still relate to audiences. And I study how they do it. Um, but I think that's a, that's a challenge too. I, I don't get worried as much as that as I see often people who have been super successful for 30 or 40 years, it's in their brain so much that they're successful and that they're either billionaires or famous or movie stars or whatever. They don't really know anymore how to connect. They've lost the ability to connect to the average person. So I get, I get, I think that's more of a danger than not being able to relate people is not being able to even know remotely how to relate to people. Um, but for me, I'm just, I am always just trying to find material. So everything bad is copy. And so you still want bad things to happen or bad things to analyze. But I don't like ranting about political opinions. I don't like, you know, doing all the garbage people do on, on Facebook all day long. Um, so yeah, I do get, I always get worried. What's the next source of creativity? What else can I try to keep learning? Right. And, and the fact that you stay, I mean, again, people always ask, is that what James is really like when the microphone's off? But that they feel like they know you just from the way that you write. I always then, tell people I'm much more disappointing in person. Because <laughs> <laughs> then when I, when I write, I'm always like uh, in the gutter in the beginning and right. crying and whatever. And then by the end, maybe I figured something out, maybe I didn't, but it's still a little disturbing. And I think I'm a little bit less interesting like than that in person. But some, what was I just listening to? Oh, the story that you told about um, you were going to pretend to be psychic on the airplane because yeah. somebody's name. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the stories that you tell sometimes are you know kind of like a little bit things that I wouldn't expect to them. Then when you tell a funny story like that, but it's like in a you invested all this time into pretending that you were going to be psychic if you ran into this one particular person. Um, and that worked. And then, I mean, I got to pull off the prank. I forget which podcast I talked about that in. I forgot. I, I I pulled off the prank to such amazing success. And the guy was not phased at all. And I couldn't believe it. Like, literally, I, I, I proved one or two things to this guy. I either proved the complete existence of God, or I proved that I must be the most disturbing person in the world. And one or the other, but he wasn't phased at all, even though it was so amazing, the prank. But anyway, It was yeah. funny to listen to. And so then, I well, guess one last question. Do you worry about what's next? How do you decide what's next with so many opportunities, so many things that you could do? How do you? Uh, I'm just always trying new things. So uh, I, I believe in what I said earlier, which is invest in yourself first, because that's where you get the greatest returns, which is a cliche, but it's true. But what people don't add is like in any, you have to treat an investment in yourself the way you would treat any other investment, which means diversification, risk management, you know, and, and all the other, you know, due diligence and all the other things that come with investing, you have to apply that also when you invest in yourself. So, so many people say, oh, invest in yourself. That's so important, but you got to treat it like a real investment. And so I diversify the investments in myself. So I'm always thinking of new things I want to try and do and experiment with. And then that's why I have to kind of also limit the time. I, I have to make sure I'm never fully a, a hundred hours a week booked. Right. And finding that balance. But I think your audience is eager to know what's James doing next. Yeah. I don't know. Cause I don't think of the, so I, I write down each day what things I can do next. And, uh, uh, we'll see. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of reality show. What do you think of this idea? So this is the idea, and you and you're connected to this a little bit in the sense that from our last podcast. So so in our last podcast, you gave a strategy by which anybody could make money and build a, a lifestyle business or more from home. And so I have this idea for a reality show. People could steal it if they want, but they're not going to. Um, the idea is I will teach you to be a millionaire, and. I take 10 random people off the street and I give each of them a different strategy and I follow the course of their lives over the course of a year and and I get bring in celebrity coaches like guests who have been on my podcast and stuff and over the course of a year I either make most of the millionaires or on the way to a millionaire or some will fail and we'll see there, there'll be drama around that. And I think that's a fun show. You think that's a good idea? I think it would be great. I think people would just be enamored to know, can the average person become a millionaire just with you know a few changes? What would it take? How do you do that? And uh, 
How would you help somebody do that? And then also, how how do people fail at it? Like, right. Because there'll be different personalities of the people I pick. And, you know, some of those personalities might be better suited. Some might be just horror stories. Uh, uh, but all of them starting from scratch. I would give them a completely new strategy that they had never done before. And one of those strategies, for instance, might be your, your, the strategy you use. Another strategy, I don't know, whatever. I, I'll, I'll keep those close to the vest. And, uh, uh, but I'm convinced I can, it was really a test for me. I'm convinced I can take anyone off the street and make them a millionaire. So that's an idea I've been debating. I think it would be fascinating to watch then. Is it a motivational issue? Does somebody have an impulse problem? Do they self-sabotage? Do they, right? And then the people who do co- become successful, what was it that helped them? Yeah, please do that. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I should do it as a podcast or a TV show or a book. I feel like people would want to know the characters. They're going to want to see them like on yeah, TV. I feel like TV it. is the best. Then, okay, then, then you have to ask, well, TV, there's so many people in the way between you and the decision and, and the money. Maybe YouTube is the best way. I don't know. Right. Well, that's, I heard Instagram just came out with a TV. Yeah, and, IGTV. Right. So there's all, all these possibilities. So, so, okay, so here's a great example though. The first step would be I could figure out the strategies. The second step could be maybe I figure out three or four people to start this with. And I start this as a little bit of a YouTube series. So I could just start videotaping and interviewing people and giving them the strategy. And I can do that within the next week. I could literally start this project within the next week. And so that's an idea I'm debating. Right, because I think for most of us, we'd think, oh, I'm going to start a TV show someday. And then someday never comes it's hard to, to fruition. So, right, and we talk ourselves out of it. So when you just come up with that and then you think, okay, what are the steps and how do I get that going? Then, yeah, if you're going to start a TV show in one week, game on. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do it. Okay, we're going to hold you to it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amy, thanks so much for coming on my show to interview me. Was it hard to research? <laughs> and no, because there's stuff everywhere about you. But as a human being, you know, clearly you're fascinating. Forbes calls you the most fascinating human on earth. Something along those lines. But then as a therapist, of course, you know, oh, what makes James tick? <laughs> How do you do these things when you say, okay, I have anxiety and I've been in at the low points in my life and I've been suicidal and yet here I am and I'm still putting myself out there and still doing hard things. Instead of just saying, okay, I'm successful. Here's how I did it. And offering advice, you're still saying, I'm learning new things. I'm doing stand up, I'm, and I might go broke again. And I think that's wonderful that you're willing to put yourself out there and let us go along for the journey rather than just making money off of telling your story and not doing anything new. Well, thanks again. And I, as, as usual, I look forward to your, your next appearance um, when you're getting ready to publish the next book, uh, 13 Things Mentally Strong Women Don't Do. I super enjoyed the first two books, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, and then 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do. As a parent and a person, <laughs> I benefited. I, I, I really thought there was a lot of overlap between your ideas and, and stuff that I've explored and talked about. And I'm so excited to see this next book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to every person I know, not just every woman I know. Thank you. That's what I hope happens. I hope lots of men read it too. Yeah, because they have to understand their their the women women better. Exactly. Like, what's going to be the difference between women and men? Well, you know, I tried to really pick out some of the things that that women in particular struggle with about um, whether it's some self esteem kinds of things and confidence issues and mm. imposter syndrome is is something I talk about in there. But things that uh, you know, sort of as a society that we've grown up a little bit different in uh, cultural issues and also just how women can push back against some of that stuff. I can't, I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so... How do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, 
Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.